trick, an illusion that we have her with us, <laughs> um, but in fact a real treat uh, to have Hillary back. <laughs> 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 Hillary, I think, was last with us um, at our 50th anniversary mm. a few years ago, and, and um, several of us have interacted ever since. We know, of course, of Hillary's work. Um, Hillary is the editor of Red Pepper, a very important progressive magazine, um, is linked to the Transnational Institute, um, and is a prolific author who over the years has really inspired many of us, I think, to, to keep our hopes alive about the importance of popular struggles and popular democracy <clears throat> around the world. I know of the long list of books that I looked up this morning, Reclaim the State, um, Experiments in Popular Democracy, The Lucas Plan, Beyond the Fragments, F Feminism and the Making of Socialism, a long history of, of important volumes that have really indicated progressive ways forward for movements uh, in the UK and around the world. <clears throat> Last time Hillary and I appeared together, it was at a moment in Porto Alegre in Brazil, and we were in a very exciting panel together about building popular democracy in Latin America. And we know that, in fact, the, the moment seems to be changing. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Slightly. And so it's, it's a great to have you, have you back. This is, in a way, is a informal launch, an IDS launch. It's been launched before. It's a launch of Hillary's latest book, um, A New Politics from the Left. And that's what she's going to be speaking to us about, summarizing some of the core arguments for those of you who haven't had a chance to see it. If you haven't had a chance, please pick it up. It's really exciting and very readable. We don't have copies here, but we have order forms in the back, and you get 50% discount if you order with those, with those forms. We will go to about 2.15. So I know some of you may have to leave by 2, but Hillary will talk for about 30 minutes. We'll open it up for conversation and dialogue, and then we'll have to move out by about 2.15 for another event that starts here at, at 2.30. If I can just mention a couple of other announcements. Um, we are recording this, as people have asked us to, to do so. If in the comments you, you're uncomfortable with recording, let us know and we can pause the recording, or if afterwards we can edit you out, if you prefer not to be there. Um, Hillary is very kindly, because of the timely events this week um, around Brazil, tomorrow back in the same room, Hillary will be back and we are doing a very exciting seminar that Alex has been organizing um, on development after Brazil's elections. What are the prospects for democracy, equity, and sustainability? And that will include the former Brazilian Minister of Social Development, Teresa Campello, who's here today, Alex Shanklin, who works a lot on Brazil, and Hillary, who has worked in Brazil and watched Brazil over the decades, will be coming back tomorrow to join us for, for that. So we're really putting Hillary to work over the next 40 hours. It's a delight, to have you, uh, delight to have you with us. Thank you so much. Thanks, John. Um, well, it's great to be here. And I have to say, on my way here, there were lots of stalls selling masks and sort of bloodshot eyes. And I thought, you know, do I want to, you know, cause some stir that will distract from my slightly unprepared talk but anyway I, I sort of spurned the temptation uh, and I'll do it on the way back um, and uh, anyway so I'm really happy to be here and actually you know you were talking about my work being inspiring but actually on the contrary you know I've been inspired by your work um, and also by the work of many other IDS people in particular Robin Murray the late Robin Murray has been a real inspiration and guide to the work that I uh, that has been kind of accumulated in, in this book. I mean, this book is like a, um, a sort of, it's not a definitive statement. It's like a contribution to the discussion. And um, in a way, this having a launch at this moment when I'm not so much in an evangelical, I want you to buy it, but I'm not in a like sort of evangelical mode. I'm trying to think through, you know, where the argument goes next, um, particularly in the face of the sort of complexities that, that arise clearly in the case of the Brazilian results and more positively in relation to the evolution of the Corbyn project. You know, it's not all onwards and upwards. There are lots of difficulties, tensions, you know, which make me, make me think that actually the title, I think, is a bit glib. You know, New Politics from the Left. It all sounds very smooth and sort of easy. But I think a title which is more accurate, which is something like 
the presuppositions and multiple levels of participatory democracy, I don't think would sell very well. Um, so if you'll excuse the, excuse the glibness, but um, what I do, what, what the book is about is trying to look at, in a way, what underlies participatory democracy. I mean, I, I suppose I've been faced since being excited by it, I suppose my first sort of um, experience of it or, or, or sort of vision of it, enthusiasm, came from 1968 when, you know, as, a, as many people of my generation in their te late teens, you know, facing governments that were, you know, Tory and Labour governments, completely the same, you know, the only options being the Soviet bloc, you know, which seemed completely undemocratic, uh, and on the other hand, sort of the, the warmongering <coughs> United States. What were the options? And a very imaginative group of students from the United States who kind of in the belly of the beast had to come up with some alternatives um, came up with a statement called the Port Huron Statement. I guess it was launched in a place called Port Huron, but it had a very clear commitment to participatory democracy as being... The, the alternative. It didn't really spell it out, but it was a, a, a strong critique of representative democracy, very influenced by C. Wright Mills, the, the brilliant sociologist who identified the military-industrial complex and, in a way, was perhaps the first, well, I don't know about the first, but a key theorist of, of state capture, if you like, of, of the, the capture of the representative, supposedly democratic state by corporations and the role particularly of the arms economy and the link between so many of the, the, the big corporations in the US and in the UK, incidentally, uh, and the military and how that provided a sort of entry into the state meant that that representative democracy was incredibly weak. So it was both a critique of the weakness of representative democracy and a pointer to the importance of addressing economic power uh, if democracy was to be rebuilt, reclaimed. So participatory democracy, for me, right from the beginning, was not just about political institutions, but also about economic institutions. Uh, and then, in a way, my next sort of inspiration, I suppose, came from um, groups of workers in a company called Lucas Aerospace, um, which maybe I should just explain for people, either younger students in the UK or international students. It was a group of workers who basically, in the 70s, they were very well organised. It was the period when the, the, the trade union movement was particularly strong at a shop floor level because they had you know, massive bargaining power because it was a boom time and so employers wanted to get, you know, get things produced so they would make concessions quite easily. And the shop stewards, particularly in engineering, had a real sense of their own capacity to control, almost control the pace of work, the conditions of work. You know, they had a sense of their own strength and their own capacity and their own skills. And they were faced with a whole set of rationalizations as you know, um, British industry came under competitive pressure from reconstructed German industry and, and so on. Uh, and so it began to rationalize and as predictably it's strategy for rationalization was to you know to see labor as the cost so to cut labor to close factories and to concentrate um, their assets their capital in a few factories um, so these workers who were well organized not just in their own workplace but across the company in what was called combine committees and that was organizations that brought together both at a workplace level combined if you like the um, the the workers in the the design rooms and the offices, the what's called white-collar workers, uh, and the um, shop floor workers, the, the blue-collar workers. Um, and they were all brought together. They, well, they brought themselves together uh, in a joint um, shop stewards combine committee in the factory. And then they realised that's not where power is. Power lies, you know, at a corporate level. So they began to organise across the factories and brought together workers, shop stewards representing, re representing the workers um, in factories across the UK. And then they began to think internationally as well. So they'd sort of followed power, as it were, followed corporate power and tried to build a counter power. So when they were told, you know, your skills are redundant, they, you know, they, they 
they, they felt, firstly, no, actually, our skills are extremely useful. And then, secondly, you know, we've got the power to stop this. So they thought they could just use their industrial muscle by, by occupying or by taking strike action. But that wasn't sufficient because the employers could just walk away and leave them occupying a sort of derelict factory. So they, they went to see Tony Benn, who was in the Department of Industry, and who was a very different kind of politician. I'll come to this later, but who actually believed in those workers who who didn't, in faced with the problem, who didn't sort of get on the phone to some trade union bureaucrat and say, hi, Alex, you know, could you come round? We've got a problem. Oh, I don't know why Alex, I just he's a particular <laughs> official. But, you know, <laughs> whoever it was, but, you know, some chummy corporate relationship with somebody, some baron in the Labour Party. He, he said, no, he, he wanted to meet the shop stewards. He'd been very influenced by the occupation of the uh, Upper Clyde shipbuilding um, yards when they were being closed, when the workers uh, didn't just occupy, they kept the yards working. And he went there. He was like a very technocratic minister. He wasn't political. He wasn't, well, he was political, obviously. He was a career politician. He wasn't a, a left winger. But he was a great believer in British industry. And he found that when he was working in the state, that he was constantly blocked by vested interests of management of the city. And then he went, when he went to these, these, the, these shipyards, he could see that the workers had, had, had a kind of passion for industry, for their craft, for, for making the ships. And he felt this is where the, the energy and the capacity to save British industry <coughs> lay. So his framework was a bit sort of corporate and, you know, nationalist, but it led to a sort of dynamic leading him in a very radical direction. And certainly being very open to shop stewards who said, can we come and see you? And he said, well, does, do they want him to nationalise aerospace? Um, and they discussed it at one of their combine meetings. And luckily, I saw a transcript of that meeting. And they were saying, well, nationalisation, it's not worked very well in our areas. A lot of them were from ex-mining areas or, you know, they'd experienced of the railways where actually these nationalised companies had carried out the same kind of rationalizations and also where the the relations of work hadn't changed there was no 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 shift in power towards towards the workers it was the same the same managers that were basically running the place i'll maybe come back to that a bit later but so they discussed they said well you know we consider nationalization but only on our terms um, and they kept saying look there's a crisis but it's not our crisis. We don't have a crisis. We can still design useful things. You know, we're not in crisis. It's the financial system or the political system that's in crisis. And then some of them had been involved in CND and, um, you know, the peace movement. And so the question came up, well, do we want to carry on making missiles? I mean, Lucas Aerospace is a key part of the military aerospace industry. And they, they said, well, let's think about alternatives. And in the, in the training of a designer, um, they're always encouraged to sort of experiment with all kinds of different designs and, and sort of explore projects and, and do prototypes of different, of different kinds of goods. And so they, they drew on their skills and said, well, actually, no, we could be producing medical equipment, um, energy preserving, energy, energy conserving equipment, uh, transport equipment so they they began to develop this idea and it wasn't it wasn't sort of natural uh, this idea of a, of a plan drawn up by the workers and they they said well first we've got to kind of find out what our capacities are what what machine tools do we have what skills do we have and they sent questionnaires around the, the factories and you know I interviewed people in all the factories and They'd say things like, well, we're not used to planning. You know, we got these questions and it got us, it got us thinking. And in a sense, this questionnaire, this innocent looking questionnaire for an inventory of skills and capacities was almost like a, a consciousness raising exercise where people became conscious of the, of the resources they had to, to think about something new. And then they were asked, so what alternatives could you, could you produce? And then came this huge list of about 150 different products that they could be producing. Uh, and then the question was, well, how do we put this together? 
Um, and this is where we get on to a key issue, which is the nature of knowledge. So they, they said, well, you know, it's not really our scene to be developing papers that we send to the Department of Industry. But what, what about designing products? So in, in a sense, they then started a whole new genre of protest, which was to actually design alternative and make prototypes of alternative products. So John was, oh no, Ian was reminding me about how um, when they were campaigning for this plan, they brought one of these products, a road rail vehicle that could move from the uh, railways to the road and make for a much, a much cheaper kind of integrated transport system. They made um, an energy conservation um, system. They made hybrid, um, hybrid cars, electricity, <coughs> electric cars, ideas way beyond their, their time. And also they began to think differently about automation and technology. They had a very clear idea that technology and technological development is, is based on, on value decisions. It's not just a kind of neutral, a neutral process of, of progress. There's decisions all the time. And we need to think about human-centered uh, technology. So we need to think about how we can use um, the technologies of telesuric devices, which is hands at a distance. So the kind of thing used to identify barnacles at the bottom of oil rigs or, you know, that kind of at a distance automation. That could be used to enhance the skill of a, of a, of a manual worker um, to do more. I mean, I don't, I'm not involved in the technology of it. But anyway, they, de they developed all these products. And in a way, the key idea there was this idea of tacit knowledge, which is very important um, in my book. And the, the gist of the book really is learning from experiences like the Lucas Aerospace experience and also the Brazilian experience of participatory budgeting, which I'll come on to in a minute. Um, I, I felt that the issue of knowledge was fundamental. And the Lucas uh, case was particularly illustrative of that. Um, but I'll just maybe sort of forward move a bit, which is that um, well, the other thing besides these experiences of participatory democracy that stimulated me to do this book and, and feeling that these needed to be in some ways not theorised exactly, but <coughs> themes needed to be drawn from them because there seemed to be a search for a new politics. And then Jeremy Corbyn popped up. And what was the slogan of his campaign? It was for a new politics. So what on earth did he mean? You know, what, what was this new politics? How did it have any substance? And um, first it was all in terms of a kinder politics. You know, he talked about kinder politics. And I thought, well, that's not very... It is, could be profound, but... It's maybe not sufficient. So what else is there in his appeal? And then we interviewed him for Red Pepper. And um, he said, I've got to now look for the quote, but he said something very interesting. He said that basically um, uh, intelligence lies with the people. And he gave an example of how he, a best friend of his um, was a street, a street sweeper. Uh, and he, but he lived in this very ecological way because he was very, very conscious of climate change. So he lived in a very mindfully, mindfully ecological way. And yet he was a street sweeper. And, and Jeremy said, look, I feel no deference to those that have had higher, higher education and no superiority to those who don't. For me, you know, wisdom is on the streets. Now that coming from a politician, particularly a Labour politician, is very, very unusual. I mean, I want to contrast it with um, one of the leading sort of architects of the welfare state, um, Beatrice Webb, who um, has these very frank diaries. I really recommend any of you working on social democracy to, to access them from the British Library uh, because it's like a detailed documentation of the, of the process of the invention of social democracy in Britain. And you know, I found myself reading them till four o'clock in the morning because it would be very gossipy. It'd be like, oh, um, William Beveridge, who's like the actual designer of the welfare state, came to tea today. He was very, um, you know, disappointed because he's not, basically, he's not being given enough 
status in the new Ackley, that's the nice 1945 Labour government. So it'd be full of all this sort of gossip that just makes you want to read more and more. Anyway, in the course of this uh, diary, he, she said one night, she said that um, sh she and her husband, Sidney, who, um, you know, they, she did everything together, had little faith in what she called the average sensual man. Presumably she meant woman, women as well. We do not believe that he can do more than describe his grievances. We do not think he can prescribe his remedies. We wish to introduce the professional expert. And then that basically, it, and I, people like her and the Fabian Society that, that she was part of, that basically provided the sort of intellectual expertise for the Labour Party. So the whole kind of... Um, edifice of, of Labour social democracy in, in Britain was based on this presumption that the working class people that were at the base of the Labour Party I mean the Labour Party in some ways is a unique party because it has the organised trade union movement at its base and linked into it but instead of treating that as an incredible resource they're treated as uh, maybe a source of money and a source of electoral campaigning but not as knowledgeable knowing economic and political citizens. Uh, and that's, that's still an important tradition. I mean, I think it's, if you, you could say there are two souls in, in Corbynism, you know, and that one of them still is a rather statist kind of um, politics. Um, but another is this, this um, recognition of the capacities of the people. So you see that in John McDonnell's latest statement that he wants to see the nationalisation of the, of the railways, of water, of all the main infrastructure, but not in the old way. You know, the old way was very, very top-down. You know, the day the, um, the National Coal Board, the flag for the, for the nationalised coal board went up, the people going into the boardrooms were not the workers or the trade union representatives or local authorities. It was the old managers from the private sector, uh, plus a few generals, retired generals from the army, because it was presumed that only they, you know, actually knew how to run something. I mean, for goodness sake, the idea that, you know, ordinary workers, who'd actually done a lot of thinking and preparation for nationalisation, could be, you know, actually given the right to, to run the industry was completely unthinkable. And I think that's the, the new possibility, that there is a a Labour Party that believes in that, that popular capacity. Um, so I try and explore, I mean, I, I try and say, look, this is where we've got to start in sort of rethinking politics. It's not about, you know, tinkering with the Constitution. It's got to be about, great, it's got to be about a sort of fundamental rethinking of the basis of public participation. And that's got to start from a recognition of the, of the capacities of the people, which are, which are not kind of just given. I mean, and they're not, um, they're not necessarily always articulated because, in a way, people are living in a society that doesn't allow the majority of people to have the time to develop their, their tacit thinking. So that it means recognising tacit knowledge, um, practical knowledge, and, and this isn't necessarily counterposed to more scientific forms of knowledge. Indeed, the idea of tacit knowledge came from a, a scientist, a chemist, who'd become a philosopher of science called Michael Polanyi, who wrote this book that's worth looking at called The Tacit Dimension. And his argument is actually not saying tacit knowledge is, is like wonderful and scientific knowledge is crap. He's saying if you look at scientific knowledge... It isn't a purely rational, you know, codified process. It involves all sorts of tacit, informal sources of knowledge, you know, so hunches, instincts, you know, that lead scientists to, to, to pursue a particular hypothesis, informal, you know, discussions that happen in any laboratory, um, any creative kind of laboratory. So it's recognising those sort of human relations um, dimensions of knowledge um, that, that are crucial to the development of science. And another illustration of this combination of practical and tacit knowledge and emotionally embedded knowledge with public policy making, 
you know, the development of, of codified alternatives comes from the women's movement, where um, I don't know how many people here can't really tell from the colour of people's hair, but um, uh, were involved in the women's movement. But, but we had a crucial kind of cell of our movement called consciousness raising groups, where we would meet and, and share experiences, you know, experiences of um, emotional struggles with our partners or would be partners, um, abortions, you know, the, the drudgery of housework, of isolation of our experiences with doctors, all these different quite experiential sort of moments and sources of knowledge, things that would be normally dismissed as, as gossip and of, of complete you know, irrelevance to public policy making. But out of sharing that, those, those, those emotions and the insights and, and, if you like, knowledge, I'm calling it knowledge, that comes from those experiences, and discussing them collectively. So I think that the sharing of this practical knowledge is fundamental to, to the argument. Um, we developed alternative policies. We developed policies around um, centres for women facing domestic violence, policies around um, rape crisis centres, uh, well women clinics, changing the whole relationship between the, the medical profession and women. So the kind of institutional revolution, as it were, that came from the women's movement was, was premised on a, a valuing of practical and tacit knowledge that's normally um, kind of marginalised. So I go into examples like this in the book, including also some examples about democratising the public sector, which I haven't, I haven't got time to explore now. Um, and then I kind of look into how do these cells... I mean, one thing I learnt from Robin Murray was the importance of the cell, the particular, learning and sort of really immersing yourself in particular examples to see really how they work, what's, what flows of knowledge, of, of action, of taking place in those cells before, before lifting off into more generalised um, um, remarks and, and, and policy making. So I tried to think what, what are the... What are the wider conditions under which those cells can lead to some kind of transition? And so there's a whole sector on civic economics and the ways in which protest movements or so-called protest movements and social movements produce actual living alternatives. So, you know, the food security movement, if you look at it in detail, is not just about protest. You know, wherever there's resistance, there's usually some vision, some which is a kind of knowledge about alternatives, and so given support, the support of a collective movement, and ideally the support of some political body, um, that movement has produced alternatives in terms of farming and in terms of um, agricultural production and selling and uh, a whole kind of alternative food movement. And you could apply this to all the great movements around climate change, um, food, feminism, um, jobs you know, uh, anything almost, you know, as you look at the detail of it, and there's always these practical economic alternatives, and I think the development of those alternatives is crucial to any possibility of transformation at a, at a state level. And so I'd better just end, because it's getting a bit long-winded, but I think that, that a lot of what I'm talking about is, is civic and is sort of beneath the radar and is often not known about. Um, and so one question is, how does it, how is it realised at a sort of national, and then we must discuss international level. And this is where we do have to bring in the state, but it's got to be a very different kind of state. So trying to envisage a state that's based on recognition of this, this tacit knowledge, in a context where really the state historically has been based on a sense of superiority and of... You know, the state has the overview, whereas, in a way, all the things I'm talking about are the underview. So, and that overview is based on a, a, a rather narrow understanding of, of science as simply, you know, laws of, of statistical correlation. How do we develop a more complex notion of knowledge and embed that in political institutions? And, in a way, that's why I'm here, to find out what you think because I don't actually know the answer. I, can, I mean, I worked at the Greater London Council, which was abolished by Mrs Thatcher, 
because it was too radical. And we tried to work in the state in a different way. And one thing was that the politicians that believed in this um, appointed people from social movements. So, you know, you walk into the state, like the Greater London Council, and it's completely militaristic. You know, you're called an officer, sometimes a senior officer, but you're definitely an officer. The building was completely hierarchical. So we were on the bottom floor. The next floor was like the members' floor. And I remember my first day or two, I would wander up there in rather sort of shabby clothes because I'd been working at home, so I wasn't used to sort of putting on power suits and things. And, and some, some senior officer, presumably, said to me, so what are you doing up here? I said, well, I've just come to see Mike Ward, who was the, the councillor then. And he, she, said, she said, or he said... Um, well, you can't do that. You can only do that through your senior officer, who happened to be Robin Murray. So, you know, that, that kind of immediately, you know, he, he was one of those senior officers who completely blew open the hierarchy. And we had... But, but key to that was having the political support of the politicians who'd been elected on a mandate of, of transformation. So that's an experience, a glimpse. But that's the task that faces um, Jeremy Corbyn, really changing the state. And I, personally, I'd say that's the task that the PT failed to address. They failed to actually change the state and instead got embroiled in a very undemocratic, corrupt set of political institutions. Um, but I'll end there. Thanks. Great. Thank you very much. <laughs>
I am Stephanie Payton, I'm currently the digital cluster here at IDS. Thanks, Lou. That's the digital, the digital cluster. So I'm going to ask you a question, difficult question about knowledge and technology. So we know that uh, platforms like Wikipedia do give a space for the sharing and kind of creation of knowledge, classic and scientific knowledge, but we also can see what's going on with social media worldwide, that the informational divides whereby poor people around the world are consuming a very kind of corrupted, limited form of knowledge and news from their kind of Facebook and WhatsApp feeds. So that knowledge, that, that fake knowledge is being shared. So I wonder how, what knowledge looks like in, in those terms, with that, the, the kind of affordances of platforms like Wikipedia and the way that technology, that the internet was designed for peer-to-peer -peer sharing, mm -hmm. and yet we're seeing the kind of monopoly surveillance capital creating these new divides. Mm -hmm. okay. Can we take a couple? Yeah. yeah okay. And those of you in the back here, the question? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. This was, okay. Could I ask people just to stand up when, so that people can hear them when you make the question? Terry. Thanks, Hilary. Terry Cannon from IDS. The comments really, I don't feel you have to answer, but I think, I hope they might contribute to the discussion. One thing about the Lucas plan was not only that the, uh, the workers designed new products which would ship Lucas out of armaments into socially useful products, but they costed it as well. And they said to Lucas, you won't lose money, you will still make profit. And, and so in that sense, it was about a it was about a shift in what capitalism was doing, but it was not actually overthrowing capitalism. Now, the intriguing thing about it is that Lucas rejected it in the similar way to, there's a parallel today with fossil fuel companies who reject the option of doing non-fossil fuel based energy, which they could easily do and make a profit. There is huge profits to be made out of wind and solar energy and so on. So the, there's one question about what is, what is it about this um, um, legacy idea that, that it is extremely difficult for them to think any differently. The, the, why do those who have power in corporations have such limited imaginations? So, so that's the first point. The second point is that uh, John had uh, a bit of trouble in the introduction around the terminology of popular democracy because Brazil now is an example of popular democracy. So it's not the kind of democracy we would like <laughs> But I think one of the things that the left does not do very well, it's not a new point, but I think we still aren't thinking about it enough, the left does not have a language for dealing with people who vote for Brexit or for Trump or for Bolsonaro. The, the left, is, its language is polarizing and making those people out to be complete enemies when they have emotional responses to their needs which have to be dealt with in a way which is... Uh, if you like, through Corbyn, a kind of politics. So the way in which this is, is the, the statements are made, all of these people are, are, are fascist or support fascism. And, and it's not true. Something has to happen to create a language which is inclusive to, to make that popular democracy what we might like. Great, thank you, Terry. Andy. Yeah, thanks very much for a really inspiring talk. I'm Andy Sterling from the Step Center. Um, I really like the way you're building tacit knowledge together with uh, the, the ideas about the state. I really look forward to reading that. But what I want to ask you now is, in regard to the crucial plurality and ambiguity and complex dependency of tacit knowledge, isn't the worst problem of the state the word the on the front of it, the definite article? And if somehow the challenge, and maybe this is, you dealt with it in the book itself, but the challenge is about somehow pluralizing that theme which is so important, but also so threatening. All right, well, three big questions there. <laughs> Come back on those, and then we'll open up for another, another round. We've got time. What was the name of the, the man in between, the Lucas, Terry? Terry, Terry, yes. Terry Gunn, Andy, and... Yeah. Okay, no, they're really good questions. I went not to answer fully. Um, <laughs> so this is just another contribution to the discussion. So, Can you hear? Do you want to stand up? I find I can think better sitting down, but I can't. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that I can stand up and try and think of something else. <laughs> you could sit on the chair in front of the desk. Yes, no, I'm not, I'm not obsessing about sitting. <laughs> um, so, on the digital, I mean, I, I agree 
but potentially, sorry, I'm trying to look at my wires. Um, I mean, I think that there is a problem, though, that in some ways the, and it's maybe related to the limits of the digital in terms of fakeness and inadequacy and distortion, is that, that, that it's not very, it's not able to be, uh, it doesn't share practical knowledge and classic knowledge very well. I mean, it's not, the means of deliberation are not very adequate. I mean, on with wiki, Wikipedia and wikis, you know, you can you can sort of change words and you can edit, but there's not a process of um, of exploration and expression. And uh, you know, I think in any development of tacit knowledge, there has to be practice. You know, the design of things, or the the painting of things, or the the expression that's a bit deeper than words, or, or you know, it's not anti-words, but it's more than words. And um, I don't think the um, digital technology can, can fully express that and share that. So again, it's a bit like um, John's point about um, power for what. In a way, the digital um, technology is like, for what? What's the context? Um, and I think that to overcome those limits um, of, of the digital as a means of communication, it has to be rooted in some real social, real life, flesh and blood sort of movement and interaction, and then it can become a, a, a very good tool. I mean, you know, you, you, well, I don't know, I'm generalizing from my rather limited use, but you know, the, the, I know Skype is very useful, but it's most useful when you've already met the person and talked to the person, had some bodily, you know, let's say, you know, we, we all need to hug each other, but some bodily contact or at least meeting and eye, eye contact, sort of some, you know, which is more than you, you don't really have to get that on Skype. So I think that the digital tools in a movement are important, but on their own, and in a way, often when they're used. Uh, in a mass context, as in sort of Brazil, they're, they're, it's, it's kind of like on their own. They're just like a bombardment of people, quite isolated and also quite compartmentalised, quite quite sort of in silos that, that the internet and the digital technology can, can exacerbate. So you almost need, um, if you're going to counter that, so you need awareness of these limits and then a movement that's going to, that's going to attempt consciously to overcome them. So a movement that's that's not reinforcing silos, but is is reaching out and producing cross fertilization. I mean, I was quite involved in the World Social Movement, World Social Forum, and the in the European Social Forum. And there, you could say digital tools are being used to to encourage cross fertilization. So far from being um, a sort of solidifying of sectors, it was like a opening up and cross fertilizing. So um, I think the digital um, technology needs to be discussed in a very, a very political, very socially driven way, which I'm sure is how you are discussing it. Um, so on the loop, on the, the question of overthrowing capitalism and the, <laughs> uh, the Lucas plan, I mean, um, it's, I think it's true that they costed it um, and it, it needn't have been that the actual product itself needn't have been uh, loss-making. And indeed, a lot of these products were taken up by other companies internationally. Um, but, I mean, capitalism isn't just about profit and, and making money in a particular moment uh, uh, around a particular product. It is about a relationship of power. You know, it is about the power of the employer to continue exploiting the, the worker. And that's what they were threatening. I think the idea that the workers could produce alternatives and do so collectively. So that's why management refused it, because it was a challenge to managers' prerogative. And if, if management had said, actually, yes, this plan is, is, you know, it's got some good aspects, or even the, sat down with the combat committee and negotiated, said, well, this product you know, let's look at its costs and its its means of, of realisation. You know, that's a possibility, the other one isn't. 
there was a negotiation. That would immediately, imagine that, that would immediately mean that they were no longer managing the company. The company was managed on the basis of some kind of shared power, managed was almost accountable to this collective of workers. And that, I mean, that would then have meant the city and the finance people, the sort of financial heart of capitalism was saying, way, you know, this is not what, you know, we don't like to invest in some company that's, you know, sharing power with workers and, you know, um, and that's why they got rid of Tony Benn and got rid of all those sort of ideas. So I think, you know, I don't know, my vision of abolishing capitalism is quite a transition. It's not going to be one moment of revolution. And I think these alternatives are like part of that transition, but there has to be a way of, of building up that power of it being accumulated in some way. And that's what, where the Labour Party was inadequate. It failed to support this or to spread it. So it's just like a one-off that was defeated. Um, so that's not a full answer, but something. So on the question of um, a language that speaks to the right, um, and I agree with you, you can't just, I feel very uncomfortable dismissing um, political leaders as fascist and sort of out, you know, that they, they, there can be no debate with their membership or their supporters. I mean, I think, I suppose the crucial thing for me is that, is that they, is that where their, their politics, their right of politics, is actually destructive of the rights of, of many, that's where we have to say, hang on a minute, this isn't consistent with a, a truly popular politics. I mean, a, my understanding of popular politics has to be a real, um, it, has, it implies an egalitarianism. It implies that people have got um, some shared capacity and shared rights to participate. And if your politics, the, as the politics of the right is saying, actually, women, you know, Bolsonaro is, is a kind of, you know, misogynist, saying actually women have got no right to participate. They must be sent back to the kitchen or, you know, whatever. Um, they're not public figures. Uh, immigrants must be sent home. So I think um, a language of inclusivity, that's a positive language, that also, I mean, that does respect the, the, the position and insecurities of of groups of people who, who have been more privileged. So in a way, recognizing their, their insecurity. And so having a politics or an economic strategy that's, that's addressing that. So that's where I think Corbyn is, is, is on the right track, when he both stands up for immigrants, migrants, and asylum seekers, and at the same time uh, has got a sort of investment plan for restoring jobs and some kind of dignity um, to, 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 the, to the northeast and the northwest. And that also, in a way, sometimes the left appears very arrogant and very um, dismissive of um, ordinary working class people. Um, and often its support for the rights for women's movements, gay movements, black movements, appear to be kind of at the cost of some ability to listen to the white working class. And so, in a way, this, this politics of knowledge is, is, is attempting to be more deeply egalitarian. Um, but that does mean challenging the sort of exclusivity of a right-wing discourse. So I can't construct that in the next few minutes into a new language, but I do think it's got to have that positively inclusive dimension to it. And then pluralizing the state. Pluralizing knowledge is. Yes. Technology. Yes, yeah. but but through some notion of a different, yeah. of, diff, of a state that isn't the state, I agree with you. So that's an interesting issue to explore in more depth. I haven't, I've sort of hinted at it, but I think um, it's interesting that it's local, the local state where experiments around popular knowledge have been more developed than at a national level, and that's I think been the challenge in Brazil that how to to extend the experiences of uh, both the Porto Alegre and those local participatory budgets, but also the PT itself, which after all was really influenced by Paulo Freire, and Paulo Freire's understanding of knowledge is very close to I mean, I'm following Paulo Freire, that idea of people's capacities and then the need for social movements and 
forms of popular education that bring out and realise that capacity. And that was, in a way, the PT quite a unique, I don't know unique, but unusually, was a party based on the idea of, of former South, for, you know, formation, popular education, of realising people's capacities. So that was that was that was that potential, that that, that immense potential of both a different kind of power, a power of transformative capacity, and linked to that, a different understanding of knowledge was never realised. Um, and I think that was because the PT felt the state was where everything had to be concentrated and wasn't willing to think of a different kind of state, which would need, you know, much more. I mean, the ideas about a plurinational state and uh, a sort of devolved state need much more exploration. Great, thank you. Let's take, a, take another round. I see one here. Yeah. Here. And here, okay. Uh, thanks for <coughs> yeah, Ben Selwyn from uh, Global Studies. Thanks very much, Larry. I think it's really important the <coughs> your emphasis on tacit knowledge and knowledge from below and movement from below. Uh, what's interesting is that you mentioned Michael Polanyi, who's the brother of Carl Polanyi, mm -hmm. and was but Michael was very good friends with Hayek, mm -hmm. and he saw tacit knowledge as, in a sense, the kind of the driving force of the market economy because it could never escape codification, which is what the state did. And it was represented the kind of genius of individual entrepreneurship in a broad sense, uh, linked together through price mechanisms, by the demand, and so on. So that's not to say that his ideas are wrong, just because he's friends with hair. But, uh, I mean, but that should make, suspicious, make us suspicious, because, I mean, a very great example of tacit knowledge generation was the 1973 period in Chile under Allende, with the Condones Industriales taking over, occupying, running factories in similar ways to Lucas Aerospace, as you mentioned, mm -hmm. and having a great idea of what society could be like, uh, making links with agrarian social movements who are themselves generating uh, kind of, well, agrarian reform by their own uh, force. And of course, what I'm getting at is what happened in uh, you know, September 11th, 1973, was Pinochet's coup, which destroyed all of that. And so the point about tacit knowledge, which you kind of got onto in the second part when you're responding, mm -hmm. is for it to be this progressive force, it has to be a force, mm -hmm. as we link together. And I think Corbyn's Labour Party is fantastic, but we have to be very aware all, at all times that it will be stamped out unless it's kind of mobilised. Mm -hmm. And this is one of the old problems of the left, which is not resolved yet, about what kind of political organisations and strategies do we have to harness this energy without statifying it, without making it some kind of codifying power from above which dulls and destroys the energy, whilst at the same time being able to defend from the inevitable and always happening onslaught from the powers of capital and the state. So mm -hmm. that's just, uh, I mean, but you half up from the answer there in the previous mm -hmm. points. Great, thanks. Thank you, Ben. Um, mine is pretty close, actually. I, I was going to give a few examples of the fact that this argument tends to be quite idealistic. And I agree with you absolutely that there are alternatives everywhere. But my experience of being involved in those alternatives is that they come, particularly outside Western Europe, with the violence of the state. You know? So I was involved in a 36-day occupation. Workers took control of factories in Colombia and Cali. 13 leaders were killed in the space of five years and the anti-privatization movement was decimated. Um, I've just come back from Kurdish areas where uh, there is an amazing, amazing democratic experiment inspired by Java, but in other parts where elected mayors put through a plan of confederalism which was trying to transform them. They're all in prison now. The whole experiment has been destroyed, and it's been destroyed by the violence and the power of the state. Mm -hmm. So when we talk about alternatives, we have to think about the defense of the territory that one gains and how to organize that. And that means you get into the reality of violence protection organization, which is the messy realities. You know, this is kind of contravention to prevent debates because we're not allowed to talk about this. But the reality is, is that ideas need to be linked to movements that have the power to defend themselves. Mm -hmm. And the danger of lots of this is that we talk about the ideas, but we don't recognize what comes with the threat to a good example. 
El Salvador, Nicaragua. We've seen the history of that, of not just national states, but imperial intervention, as we've seen, for example, in Rojava, the, the Kurdish allies that were quite, the US was quite happy to use, and then when it came to geopolitics, suddenly switch sides and leave them to be slaughtered. So I think that there is an element needed for reality of violence that is, you know, the shift to fascism is an example of the fact that the failure of neoliberalism is being resolved now for a new wave of fascism. And that is the reality that many of us have to challenge. Great, thank you. And your name? Uh, Mario Novet, Sussex. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Jonathan Harwood, my question follows on from the previous two uh, in a way. I, I find your proposals very encouraging and um, a recent interview with Anne Pettifer suggests that maybe she is perhaps thinking along similar lines, that grassroots organization is the way forward. You, you're not going to be able to rely on, on mainstream political parties. But of course, grassroots organization or uh, extra parliamentary opposition is, is not a new idea on the left. And some of these movements in the past have been much more successful than others. So I wondered what your judgment is on whether we understand sufficiently what makes for an effective grassroots organization versus one that's going to get crunched or just dissipate uh, in order not to make many of the mistakes that these movements have made in the past. Wait, is this linked to, to this theme? Okay, let's, let's pick this one up and then we'll get every chance. Hi, Hillary. Thank you for this very interesting talk. Uh, my question sort of follows on the point on repression and violence. And I wanted to ask about this again in the context of lean transfer. So what I see in a lot of cases is that many of these alternative experiments and these attempts to, to develop tacit knowledge, they might choose to not scale that up because that is also a strategic choice to avoid the repression of the state and the backlash of the state. And I wonder where you see that fitting into your argument as well, because this is most certainly the case in many authoritarian settings where people want to strategically avoid that kind of scale. <coughs> Thank you. Great, so we move for some of the optimism, the ideas, <laughs> to a series of questions, and I think they're relevant around the world. We're seeing in our work with the closing of some space through violence and, and laws and Others that are actually repressing the means of the directors the violence of the state. How do we protect our character? Okay, well, I certainly can't fully answer that. But um, first, I should just deal with Hayek. Because I, I got interested in Hayek too, because I was um, involved in 1989 in the movements in Eastern Europe. At least I, I was interested in being involved. And so I had some vision along with Mary Calvo, who's um, at, connected to SPRU, mm -hmm. but at LSE, uh, about bringing together the movements in the East, the dis dissident movements in the East, like Charter 77 and Frankfurt Havel, and the movements in East Germany, with the movements in the West. And I have sort of vision that they would be about democratizing the state, and we would be about socializing capitalism. And, and somehow we could create some, you know, basis of a, of a different vision of Europe. But I went to um, Wenceslas Square and went to see the young activists who had been part of Wenceslas Square. And they were pleased to see me, but not because I was part of the social movements in um, the West or part of the peace movement, but because I came from Thatcher land. And, and, and I was part of the, well, I wasn't, but I was, they, they hoped I was part of the sort of free market movement. So I thought, oh God, I better, I really made me think, so I paced the streets of Prague and thought, oh, I better explore this a bit more. So I interviewed a guy who translated Hayek into Czech um, to understand what was the appeal. You know, clearly it was the appeal of a critique of the all-knowing extent. So I went to read Hayek when I got back to Manchester where I was uh, having a job. And, and, um, and I remember, you know, I can almost remember where I was sitting in the library. You know, I read his article on knowledge. There was a whole essay on, on knowledge. And it was all about tacit knowledge. And I thought, fuck me, you know, this is, I've kind of heard about tacit knowledge from movements, from the women's movement, from the Lucas Aerospace stewards. So what's going on here, this free market <coughs> guru talking about tacit knowledge? 
quoting Michael Polanyi, or I haven't then read. Um, and then it, what, the conclusion of this kind of this long-winded story is that I realised that actually we had an answer to Hayek that the traditional left didn't, because we in the social movements that is could say yes, we value tacit knowledge, but it's not inherently individual. I mean, he had another essay about individualism where he said that basically this tacit knowledge was almost inherently individual. It was almost like the colour of our eyes or the colour of our hair. It was, like, it was like our individual knowledge. So it's not accidental for him that the model was the entrepreneur who had this tacit knowledge about opportunities. But what were our movements? Our movements, in a way you could say, were primarily, or in a fundamental way, about sharing knowledge in order to then develop purpose and will, but of a very experimental, unpredictive kind. So unlike the state, which, which because it's based on some notion of keeping order, it's an, an, an needs an overview. It, it's based on a very product, predictive, very narrow understanding of science and knowledge. Um, and the alternative is this idea of um, the not knowledge of the individual that can only be coordinated through the haphazard process of the market and the price mechanism. And what we were developing in practice through social movements was the idea of being uh, not all knowing, but, but no, sufficiently knowing to be able to see the possible consequences of what we could do and to have a social purpose. And that implied a constant process of experimentation, of reviewing our experience, of of sharing our knowledge. So it implies a very different form of organization. Um, but it does imply the possibility of collective of collective organization. Um, so anyway, so I do feel I can answer Hayek. And I think Polanyi, I did get fascinated by reading about Polanyi and Karl and Michael Polanyi and Karl and, and so on. And okay, Polanyi did at a certain time sort of contribute to encounter the Cold War literature and sort of I don't know, and was friendly with Hayek, maybe. But, I mean, I don't think he was, he wasn't an advocate of the free market. He didn't make the same deductions. He didn't make my deductions either. I mean, he wasn't involved in social movements or, you know, but, but I think his concepts, when you look at his book, it is about, it is about the collective nature of science. I mean, collective is the wrong word, but the, the social nature of science, which leads to a production. Of tacit knowledge, but now on this question of um, of of, um, of defending social movements, I mean, I, I, I well, it's a, it's um it's a problem in many ways that I've encountered. I suppose my first encounter was in Mozambique. I mean, I wasn't in Mozambique, but I supported the movements uh, against Portuguese colonialism. So I was very um, very inspired by by Philema's notion of liberating servants, um, where they, you know, they prefigured, if you like, as we said in the women's movement, they prefigured in the, the daily alternatives that were being created, um, the alternative society they were trying to fight for. So that was a kind of creation and duplication of the cells of an alternative. Um, but it was constantly connected to a guerrilla movement, indeed, the nature of the guerrilla movement, as with all the <coughs> guerrillas, was it, that it was rooted in that, in that, in those liberated zones. It both defended them, and it was also rooted in them. Um, I mean, the way the war then developed and with the, um, <coughs> the South African response to, I can't remember the rival, oh, Renamo, yes. It, it, in a way, Filimo became more militaristic and less engaged in those liberated zones. I don't I follow the story fully, but the end result was Filimo became a much more traditional sort of top-down sort of party, though it probably didn't lose altogether its sort of more emancipatory, transformative roots. But um, I think that the, the kind of key there, just to learn briefly from that, but it's got implications for other experiences, including the trade unions, because in a way, Lucas, the shop stewards had to as well as developing this alternative, they had to at the same time 
is seen by their members to be defending their members' rights and their members' wages and conditions. So they have to have a double strategy. And maybe that's an aspect of the, the, what needs to be think, thought about. So not to think about politics as like acquiring one single strategy, that you can have, or you need to have, different levels. So this idea of um, two understandings and power, power as transformative capacity and power as domination, and then thinking how can they combine, how can the, um, the, the, the resources of power as, of dom as domination, the resources of the state, and fighting for those resources, including fighting to dismantle the military, be used as a sort of resource for transformative capacity. Um, I think it entails kind of a division of labour, but a, a division of labour in which there's mutual understanding. So, for example, we do, sorry to go on about the Labour Party, but it's sort of on my mind. But, you know, the Labour Party, I respect, you know, the, the, the people in Jeremy Corbyn's team who are absolutely obsessed with winning the election. On the other hand, I would argue that, that they'll never win the election, but also they'll never achieve social transformation unless the momentum and, and the allies' momentum in communities and in workplaces, in the trade unions, have the autonomy and the encouragement to develop alternatives in the here and now and prefigure what, what, what Corbyn is trying to do. Uh, and so I think one needs that defensive side to an organisation, which might include a military, a guerrilla army or a military sort of wing. I don't know enough about the politics of left militarism, but, but it needs to be, in a way, aware of the fact that it's part of a dual strategy in which power of transformation is fundamental to the, to the final possibilities of change. And I think often the, there's been this sort of dichotomy, so the party has presumed superiority and has ended up, you know, maybe winning in some sense, as in the case of Mozambique, but, but, but having lost a lot of its transformative base. Uh, and so the, in answer to the last question, what uh, makes for um, an effective social movement? And I'd say perhaps it's overcoming that binary, so rejecting this choice between either going for political power, governmental power, through the election or through the military, and on the other hand, developing these actual grassroots alternatives. It's got to be about both, and the two forms of organisation have got to respect each other and be kind of constantly rooted in each other. So in a way, in the early days of Prolimo, <coughs> when the guerrilla movement was rooted in those liberated zones, is a kind of model. And what we could be imagining elsewhere, where there is a recognition of the importance of, and the discipline of the, of the military or of the electoral. Because it is a discipline, because one's fighting an enemy whose terms of combat are not well, our own. And sometimes we have to kind of fight on their terms but not, at that point, suffocate the emergence of, of alternatives. So that's a sort of sketchy answer that I hope to hear more of, that I hope to have criticised and developed. So the final question there about intentionally working beneath the radar and not going to scale, and is a, yeah. a form of protection trying to remain beneath radar and, and not become visible? <laughs> at what point do you have to become visible to get power? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know exactly, but I, I do know that that if you become invisible, you can be very vulnerable too. That you need allies, and that there are not many examples of invisible forms of transformative power that 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 last and spread. I mean, there are some, but you you know you're in constant danger of either co-option or. There's, there's a whole kind of layer of cooperatives, you could say, who um, have, have sort of worked at a very gradual sort of level, but then have just been, you know, eliminated by the power of the corporate market, or, you know, I think some kind of protection, some kind of reliance with um, a, a supportive state is necessary. 
but you know, the, I think there might, there's nothing wrong with you know building as a strong a base as possible autonomously. So it's the autonomy of these movements, I think, is crucial, and sometimes that's what people who consciously or movements that consciously choose not to scale up a say and say, look, our autonomy is in danger if we, you know, align with the Labour Party or with a political party. We need to just, I mean, you could say, I mean, the MST is interesting in a way because, in Brazil, because the Landers movement, because they, they put a lot of emphasis on autonomy. They haven't refused to scale up because in a way they said, look, the conditions for realising the needs of our members requires land reform. But we're going to, we're going to develop our alternative forms of agriculture and organisation, whether or not you know, the, the PT delivers. So they've, they've been able, as far as I understand, to slightly withstand the, the, the weaknesses of the PT and, and the ups and downs of the PT and have managed to they've got a sufficient organisation and material base to, to survive, as far as I know. Great, thank, thank you very much. I'm sure we could go on, but we need to, to wind up. This has been really rich. I think at the end, you were hinting, and then Andy, this comes to your question. I, I think you also have a wonderful paragraph here, which you see my book is totally marked up. Where you talk not about the way, or the strategy, or the knowledge, when you talk about the importance of combining ecologies of knowledge mm. with ecologies of ownership and ecologies of politics. And I, I think what you're saying now, it's not a single strategy, it's dual strategies, multiple strategies, all of which are based on different forms of respect or different forms of, of knowledge. So I'm sure we'll come back tomorrow with some of these themes in the special session at 1 o'clock tomorrow on Brazil as a microcosm of many of these questions we're talking about. Um, meanwhile, Hillary, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. And reminder, if you want to get the uh, sign up for the book, you can get it in your channel.